Good morning. I'm presenting our paper from Shapes to Shapes, inferring checker shapes for Sparkle construct queries. And this is joint work with Daniel Hernandez, who's also here today, as well as Ralf Lemme and Steffen Stab. So let's first look at uh, how do I continue? Okay, so let's first look at um, the problem that we're trying to solve. So a Sparkle construct query, let's name it Q, takes some um, uh, input graph and produces a corresponding output graph. And for some other input, it produces another graph and so forth. A and apparently I'm muted, I don't know. Um, so, and when working with REF data, um, you might also have some set of shackle shapes, which are then used to validate your data, right? And we call the set here um, as in. And all the graphs that you really care about as inputs to your query are valid with respect to the set of shapes. So this is kind of the setup situation that we're taking. And the problem we are looking at in our paper is, can we take the set of input shapes and the construct query, and can we then infer a set of shapes as out, so that all the corresponding output graphs for valid inputs of this query conform to the set of shapes as out. Now this is different from some related work that's about inferring shapes from instance um, data directly, because our approach is independent of any of the concrete instance data in these graphs, right? So if you imagine a query as a function on graphs, we're basically taking the query and we're taking a set of shapes as the input type of this query, and we're referring the result type again as a set of shapes. Okay, so let's look at, look at a simple example. Um, here we have a Sparkle construct query, and in our paper we're supporting conjunctive queries specifically, and here um, we have some variable y, and we match it on the type b, and also on some incoming property p, and we might have some other pattern which matches z on e, and which also have has an uh, incoming uh, p property. And with all these bindings from matching this um, pattern on the graph, we then construct new triples in the construct part of the query, um, which here get type f for all the y's and type z, uh, type g for all the z, and some r property between them. And from this, we the, the graph is constructed, right? And we might also have some input shapes. In this example, a single shape that says that every b is an e. Uh, and I'm using informal language here to describe shackle, but in our paper we are supporting a normal subset of shackle. So, and this shape here means that we match on class b, and these uh, all nodes of class b must also have type e. Now with this uh, given information, the question becomes how can we now construct the respective output shapes that must hold or that hold on all output graphs. And in order to do this, we need to combine the knowledge from our input shapes and from the query. So in this example, we might look at the query and see that y is of type b and z is of type e. And since we know that every b is an e and the remaining constraints are kind of the same, we can infer that the bindings for y must be a subset of the bindings of z intuitively. And with this, we can then look at the construct part where we assign y with uh, type f and z with g. So from combining this, we know that every f is a g, and this holds on all output graphs. So this is one way of inferring, um, inferring these shapes, or intuitively inferring the shapes. Another is just by looking at the template itself. And in the template itself, there's also some shapes that are implicit there. So for example, every f has at least one r edge to a g. Right? This is implicit just in the template. And there's, of course, some other shapes here that are omitted from the slides. So the question is, how can we um, formalize this in a common formalism to, um, to come up with these output shapes? And what we're doing in our paper is using description logics, and we're basing this on um, a paper by Bogatz et al., uh, which basically says that the shackle is kind of a description logic, which allows us to encode a shackle shape like every B is an E in a description logic axiom B subsumed by E. And the left-hand side of this subsumption axiom is then the target query, and the right-hand side is the constraint. So with this, um, with this basic idea, we can define a set of axioms that consists of our input shapes encoded in description logics. And if we can now also find some encoding that um, axiomatizes the relationship of the inputs and outputs in our query, and let's call it Q infer for now, this is something we infer from the query and we will look at in a, in a moment, then we can use the set of axiom as we show in our paper to check for entailment of some shape S. And if a shape S is entailed by these axioms, then we know that is, it is in the output. Now this is 
and as annotated here, modulo namespaces. So this only is uh, holds for the namespace of the output. Um, in the slides, I'm making this very simple by using completely disjoint um, namespaces. So the uh, input shapes uh, so and, and input graphs have a completely different namespace. Um, and the, the output graphs have this namespace which only involves F, G, and R. But of course, in um, in our algorithm and in our implementation, we need to make sure that to differentiate um, these namespaces explicitly because they could be using the same names, but the meanings of these names are, of course, pos potentially different. So we have this um, set of axioms now, which for now includes our input shapes encoded as description object axioms. So how can we now come up with um, axioms that encode the relationship of input and output through our query. And if you remember back to the intu intuition about the subsets of bindings for query variables, this is kind of the core um, relevant idea here um, because we can define fresh concepts for each query variable. And these concepts, for example, the, the concept X for the variable X, um, the extensions of these concepts are the sets of bindings that a variable takes during query execution. And this um, meaning of these variables remains the same between the construct part and the where part, or the where part and the construct part of the query. So this is kind of the connecting factor between both um, both sides. So what we can then do is um, infer constraints on these variables to define them based on the where part of the query. And here's a set of a few of them. Um, and we can maybe look explicitly at on one example. So if you say that in the um, query x, pz, and zae, um, this becomes the constraint that this concept, um, variable concept x, is equal to e intersected with um, exists p minus x, right? And there's some more which are omitted from the slides, but basically these constraints just define or constrain the variable concepts in terms of the original graphs. And then in the second step, we can define additional axioms for encoding the new concepts, which are defined by the construct part of the query. So for example, again, the pattern ZAG in the construct part, which assigns type G for all the bindings of Z, and there's no other constraints here for G because it only occurs once, so we know that G is equal to Z and we can include this axiom in our set of axioms. So the second part kind of defines the new um, concepts valid on for the output. Um, now more generally, we call this the WCA encoding of our query. So um, which is basically a closed word assumption over all the names that occur in the query. And we do this for all the concept names, for the variables, as well as for the role names or the properties in the query. And you can look at the details in our paper if you're interested. Um, so as I said, um, or as I demonstrated in the intuitive example, we really care about the subsumption relationships also of these variables, because they kind of are also part of this connecting factor between input and output. And in this particular case, why subsumed by Z is not already entailed. Sometimes these axioms allow you to infer this, but in this case, that's not yet the case. So another step we're taking, or we can take, is look at the where part of the query and differentiate it in different components that do not share variables. So for example, in this example here, we have two components, one component which only includes W and Y, and one component only including X and Z. And as we show in our paper, if you have these components, you can try to find a mapping between them, a mapping H of the variables in one component to the variables in another component. And if you find such a mapping, such that one component is syntactically a subset of the other component, then this implies a subsumption between the um, respective variable concepts. So for example, if we can map X to W, we know that W is subsumed by X. And if you look at this example here, you might notice that this doesn't work, right? Because Y is a B and Z is a E, and you can't find a mapping between variables such as there's a syntactic subsumption. However, if you also remember back to one of our input shapes, B subsumed by E, we can actually use this shape to extend one component without changing its semantics. We can add the pattern Y A E um, to the, the pattern above. It doesn't change the semantics because we always know that this pattern is matched because every B is an E. And if we have this extended component now, then we can find a mapping, mapping X to W and Z to Y. And we can, you know, I'm giving it here explicitly, and then this is actually 
a subset syntactically of the extended component. And from this, um, um, from this uh, subset relationship of this extended component, we then get the additional subsumption axioms. Um, so we have W is subsumed by X and Y is subsumed by Z, which can be added to the set of axioms that we construct. So we now have the entire set of axioms. And um, what we can now do is use these axioms to check for which axioms are entailed by them. And in our paper, we're constructing all possible candidates from the um, names that occur in the construct part of the query, and then filter them by checking for entailment. So in this example here, we might have um, that f is subsumed by g, which is entailed by these axioms, which is also the example I gave in the beginning. Um, if we check g subsumed by f, then this is not entailed, and it doesn't hold on the output graphs. We also have the shape f subsumed by exists rg, um, which follows from the template, the shape um, I gave in the beginning, and there's some other shapes here that also um, follow by entailment. If you're interested in the entire set of shapes, you can look at our paper where we also have this example with slightly different names, but it's the same example. Um, and this includes all the intermediate axioms that are omitted here, as well as all the shapes um, that are valid in this example. And you can also look at our implementation on GitHub under softlang slash S2S, which includes also these examples. So we can also look at the intermediate um, axioms. You can look at all the shapes that are entailed. And you can also use the implementation um, for just trying out some other examples. Um, yes, and with this, um, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, then please feel free to ask. <laughs>